the, the event that changed my life that gave you, you know, it was a turning point. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I, I was still in high school. I'd, I'd, I'd gotten left back in high school because I, I chose to quit. And I sold, I sold marijuana for a little while, about, about a year. And then I got, I got caught actually here at UConn. I used to work at Buckley Dining Hall. Yeah, and so I got caught, I got arrested, I fought a case for seven months, but I still got convicted. One year suspended after 30 days served in uh, Harvard Correctional. So that was in 2007. I was 19 when I did that bid. Was it life changing? Absolutely. You know, did I contemplate a lot in there? Absolutely. And it was definitely something that I use as fuel there, thereafter and, you know, it was really something that I, I plan to not do ever again. I don't really want to visit that place. I didn't have a, a terrible experience in there. I didn't, didn't have any confrontations, anything of the sort. But I did reflect a lot in there. You know, a month, I'm 19 years old. I still, I still have to finish my senior year in high school. And, and it was a lot, it was a lot to think about and a lot to, to a lot, like I said, a lot to reflect when you were, when I was in there. So mostly I don't want to come back here. And the main reason for that was your freedom is stripped. You know what I mean? And like there's, there's an official who owns you basically. It's like they own you. They tell you what to do day in and day out. If they tell you get on your bunk, you have to get on your bunk. Feet on the bunk, your feet have to be on the bunk. You never, ever want that kind of freedom stripped from you. It's, it's really something, it's really something that you reflect on when it's happening and you realize that it's something that you never, ever, ever want, ever again. We let a, uh, I guess you would say a typical Willimantic life, Willimantic life is like that, that's just how, that's just how it is. Uh, but there's always something a little different about my brother and I, and, and I think I'm realizing that now. Being, being half Indian always had a toll on us. It always, it, you know, it just provides something different, some kind of dynamic that's, that's essential to our character, but it's also different in the context in which we live. It's, it's very different from everybody else, you know. So we're Hispanic, 100% culturally, but there's still something there that's different. It's a, it's, a, it's a presence that we can't define, it's tacit, but we know it's different. In school, I was always a, a person who, who had potential. And when I chose to not be <laughs> a jerk about it, then you know, I, I think I was a fairly good student. But, but on the whole, I was always a misbehave and lashed out and, and I always did those things. Never really understood why, but I just had a real problem with authority. I had a severe problem with authority. When I was 15, maybe 15 and a half or almost 16, I quit. I quit high school altogether. I said, no, I don't want to do this. This is not for me. It started going a little downhill because I wasn't in school. So I wasn't really being helped by anybody. Sometimes I used to sleep in my car. I had a car when I was 16. My first job was in Kentucky Fried Chicken. I used to work at Kentucky Fried Chicken. And, you know, it was, I worked like a kid is supposed to, a part-time job. It was a couple hours here and there. I'd say not even 20. So I had some money, but I used to just blow it on weed all the time. My mom used to work in jobs that she, she shouldn't have worked, but she needed to given the circumstances. So, you know, we say those, those very harsh labor jobs that Mexicans do for very little money. My mom used to work those. She used to work with her husband in a tobacco farm. So at this time, this was in 1999, and she worked for, she was working for a while and, you know, she was saving up to go to that vacation. We all knew she was going to go for two weeks and I thought she deserved it. So she left, but she never came back. I didn't see my mom for three years. Didn't know anything about her. Didn't see her. I didn't hear from her. I didn't, we didn't have Facebook or MySpace then, so there was no way to be in contact with her you know through some kind of social network you couldn't google her she was off the radar and in that time my grandfather passed in 1999 in october 
Now this was his favorite, like my, my mom was my grandfather's favorite, you know, and her kids were obviously, you, you know, you try not to pick being a grandparent or a parent, but her kids were obviously his favorite too. So it was very devastating for her. She left, didn't know anything about it, came back and her dad died. So my mom left us with this lady and it was, uh, that, was that was an experience. She had, she had three kids, Jen, Eddie, BJ. And to this day, I was still calling my cousins. Because that's how I felt, we, you know, we went through that experience, so they're my cousins. Couldn't change it if, 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 I, if I made them blood, wouldn't change anything. So we stayed in this house for a whole summer. And it was a very, very, very harsh experience, very harsh. You know, I didn't know, I was a young kid, but I came to find out that they had, they had an addiction. And so my mom did. My mom didn't just leave us thrown somewhere. She had this plan, and she left, you know, enough money. You know, what, what, enough. It was enough, and clothes and etc. But obviously, it went. It was used for the wrong things. So we suffered just like the rest of them. But we lived that summer. I don't even remember ever having socks on. I remember having underwear. Always remember being hungry. That was like. Always, always, always. It's a never-ending feeling. And we'd always do... See, see when, you're, when I was 16, I'd do whatever to acquire money so that I can get weed. And second was that. Was, to that was food. But when you're, when you're 11 years old, and my brother, was, my brother was only 12, you know, 12, 12 and a half. He wasn't even 13 yet. So he's young too. And then our cousins, Eddie and BJ, they were, Eddie was two years younger than me, so he was about nine, and BJ was eight, so they were little. And, you know, kids going hungry like that at that age, it's not the, it's not the greatest experience. So we, like I said, when I was 16, I did anything and everything to try to acquire money so that I could get my weed. At the, when I was living with them, we did anything and everything to try to get food. So we lived with them for a while until finally... Some family members came by and, and, and didn't think it appropriate for us to be living there with them. So we got split up between the family. And then, like I said, my mom came back in 2002. So, and our relationship with our mom changed a lot. You know, we resented her at first, especially me and my brother, I think, because we were older, we're the boys, we're like, we're much closer to her. We, we appreciate her more as, as a mother than we do than we do a father because we don't know a father. So, you know, the, there's a couple events that just kind of accumulated and would lead up to living that kind of life when I was 16. Actually, I wanted to have a conversation about astronomy. I still remember this. Or astrology, I, I think I got them confused. But, you know, about like the stars and cosmology and all that stuff. And I wanted to talk about that. And they were like, oh, you always want to talk about Jupiter. And I was like, but it's not, it's not about Jupiter. I just want to talk about something other than girls that we don't have, cars that we can't get, and a life that we can't live, you know? And like, we were such dreamers. And we dreamt to the point that we were already in the dream. Like we sometimes used to talk as if this was happening already. This was already happening. So I, one day I just got tired and, you know, it was like, we're not... None of this is happening. So I, I quit weed cold turkey. And I was almost, almost, I was about almost 18. And I decided to go back to school. So I went back to high school. And I was doing, and I was doing all right. And remember I said my reputation in high school was not bad. It was terrible. Like teachers had heard that I was back in the school and I was, and I was taking, remember I didn't get any credit the first time I was there. So uh, these teachers, I was having them again as teachers. And they, I, they, their faces when I'd walk in their class like, but I sat down and started off, I did well, I did, you know, and these teachers really changed their mind about me and I kind of earned their respect. And I had to work a little harder than everybody else to earn that because of the reputation I had built for myself, you understand? And I, and I had decent grades that semester too. But like I said, things got tough. I had to start doing something to contribute. So, and so then I, I chose to start selling weed. It was very light as far as risk. So I thought, 
But one day I was working and then the cops came in in the back. And like I said, I fought that case for seven months and then I ended up going to jail. So then after jail, I just didn't look back. My senior year, I had not one infraction. I didn't get anything less than a B. So then I founded poetry. You know, and I, the, the re, the, I first started poetry because I met this guy, his name is Milton Jackson, and he's an Eastern alumni. He went to Eastern Connecticut State University. He, and he, he, they love that guy there. You know, he did so much and he's a poet. And I, and my, uh, the teacher that was our manager, Mrs. Frazier, she's like another mother to me. Um, she, she's, she's very much helped in like, she very much helped bred, like breed me into the man I am now. You know, she's, I reflect a lot of her. You know, you are what you so associate yourself with the way you want to associate yourself with them. So if you were to meet her, you would see what I get from her. You understand? So that's why I said she's like a second mother to me. It's one of those things. Going from being that 14-year-old walking in there to, that, to being the 20-year-old. Fine, it took me six years. Granted. But being the 20-year-old whose picture was bigger than the valedictorians just because he, he was selected as the poet of the class and, and just because I finished, you know. It was great. It was a great feeling. And then I, got, then I went to college. And I went to community college part-time for a little while. Just didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't even have it in store that I'd be in college at all. And at the same time, I started working at this camp. And I still work there. It's called Camp Horizons. And when I got hired there, I couldn't even express how grateful I was for that job because I had come out of jail in 2007. And ever since that day, it was the most difficult thing was to get a job because that just appears on your record. Boop, it pops up. And even if it doesn't, I put that on an application because I'm not going to lie about it. You know, because when you lie, they run a background check. They find it anyway. So why lie about it? So I always put that there. So I was very discouraged. This is, remember, I came out of jail in, in August of 2007. This is September of 2008. I went with my boy. I dropped an application. So this is my first semester in college as well. I dropped an application and I'm like discouraged, you know. He's like, have you called? And I'm like, I'm not going to call. They're not going to hire me. I'm a felon, you know, that just doesn't really happen. They're not going to hire me at a camp for special needs. But I called and they did mention it. They did mention it. They were like, I see that you have this record. And I don't know why, but something told I was just like, look, just give me an interview and I will explain everything. And if you don't like me, don't hire me. And she gave me an interview, an hour and 15 minute interview, the longest interview I've ever had for a job. They're usually quicker than that, you know, like 20 minutes or something like that. Longest interview and she was like, yeah, I like you, but I had to go through this process because I was a felon. So I had to also be interviewed by the director and I had to also be interviewed by the executive director who's the owner of Camp Horizons. And I decided to stay one more semester at my community college and, and come to UConn instead. That's what I decided. And UConn was a big deal. Why was UConn a big deal? Because I was arrested here. <laughs> I worked here and I was arrested here and I did jail time for what I did here. And when I finish, I don't feel like I, I still won't feel like I'll be ready to go into practice. I just need to gain some more experience. And I love travel. I, I have friends in South America. I go there all the time. But I want to, I want to see more. And I, and I not only want to see, I want to do while I'm seeing. Because if there's one thing I dislike that I have inside, it's regret. So at this age, at 25, a lot of the things that come into my head, like, man, I should have done that in high school. I just do it. That's another reason why I just decided to go into theater, because in, it was one of those things when I first left high school that I was like, I should have done that in high school. Well, why should I have? Do it now, you know? And that's, that's what I encourage anybody to do. It's not too late. I'm almost 26 years old. And, and anything that comes to my head, I, I try it. I do it. That you only live once, man, and that's as cliche as it is, right? Well, we all YOLO. Everybody lives by the by the motto YOLO. Well, use the motto for real. When something goes in your head and you think I should have done that, don't should have, do it, right? Live with very little shoulds and very many experiences you will acquire. You know, and at the very least, man, it doesn't matter how successful you were. You have stuff to tell your kids and stuff to learn from. And that's my goal.